On 31 March 1939, the French and British governments pledged full support to Poland in case of aggression, and England a month later even guaranteed the inviolability of Polish borders. This was the basis of the planning of the Polish headquarters. France and England protested against the entry of the Wehrmacht into Poland, and on 3 September 1939 declared war on Germany. At first these facts embarrassed me and my comrades. But this unpleasant feeling soon disappeared under the impression of the Wehrmacht's lightning-fast operation in Poland, and we thought, let the French and English come to us, they will be given a proper welcome. But they did not come. True, French troops were pulled up to the frontier, and the British Expeditionary Army was moved into France. But that was the end of it for the time being. They watched quietly as Poland, whose inviolability they had guaranteed, was crushed by German divisions. The French army holed up in the dugouts of the Maginot Line and in field positions, limited to sending out reconnaissance detachments towards the German border, occasionally shot French artillery. The British Expeditionary Corps was stationed behind the Maginot Line. Officers played tennis and soldiers played football. Both officers and soldiers showed interest in the society of French ladies. Occasionally a few British aeroplanes made reconnaissance flights towards the German frontier, but the British Expeditionary Corps continued to be inactive. Hitler quietly withdrew the divisions of the active army from Poland and moved them to the west, where at first the Western Wall had a rather weak force. The French and British continued to be inactive. The period of the so-called Strange War had begun. Our Manning Department was still in its garrison, and we were still training recruits as before. More and more often we asked ourselves what would happen next. We had only one answer to this question. We would continue our march relying on the western rampart. It was not difficult for us to find arguments. The decisive argument was this, should not France and England blame themselves if we attacked them? After all, it was they who dared to declare war on the great German Reich. Isn't the right on our side? So we will move on to the campaign, at the beginning of November, Mel was summoned to the Chancellery. It was the decisive hour for about 50 men from the Manning Department. The army in action had called for replenishment. We received field uniforms and were to go with the formed unit to the Rhine, to the front line where the strange war was being fought. How envious we were of those who were still in the barracks. Near Cologne was the 12th Infantry Division, which had arrived from Schwerin. We were attached to its anti-tank battalion. That's when it was sobering. Our function remained manning. The division, however, suffered some damage, but during the 18 days of war in Poland, it was by no means constantly in the zone of hurricane fire. The anti-tank battalion hardly saw any Polish tanks, and only one overzealous young lieutenant tried in vain to destroy a Polish tank platoon with a small 37mm gun, and in doing so unnecessarily killed soldiers. Nevertheless, all of them, from the battalion commander to the field kitchen cook, considered themselves old gunpowder-scarred fighters, and were dismissive of the inexperienced rear guards. The division was stationed in villages. In all the houses soldiers occupied every room, corner, sofas and couches. There were more military than civilians in the Rhineland, but almost everywhere good relations were established between landlords and tenants. This can be explained by the fact that the Rhinelanders are particularly hospitable, and at that time they, like us, were caught up in the excitement. In addition, Nazi propaganda had done its job, evoking the times of the French occupation of the Rhineland after the First World War. Nothing had changed in our official duties of manning the units. We still trained soldiers. Sometimes there were difficulties if a platoon commander trained soldiers who had already had a taste of Poland. Of course, the recruitment officers tried to learn from the experience of others as quickly as possible. We soon got used to the company. In between exercises, we had fun. There was plenty of wine and beautiful girls in the Rhineland. There are still many people on the Rhine whose fathers come from Thuringia, Saxony, Mecklenburg or Brandenburg, or even from Pomerania or Silesia. After the war, many of them, if they survived, returned to the Rhineland. On 9 April 1940, Wehrmacht units invaded Denmark and Norway and very quickly captured these countries as well. We no longer thought about what was just and what was unjust, but celebrated the new victory. German soldiers reached the Arctic Circle. In Germany we became cramped, the Wehrmacht's field of action was now Europe. The hero of the day was General Dietl, who commanded the German troops at Narvik. We marvelled at Hitler, who was ahead of the British, and at his supposed genius as a commander. 
we believed in him and in the strength of our army. On our front, the matter was limited to the actions of individual reconnaissance detachments from one side to the other, the fire of French artillery, to which our artillery men responded, and reconnaissance sorties of aircraft on both sides. There were single bombing hits. But the French remained on the Maginot Line, and their English allies were stationed in the French flats as comfortably as we were in the Rhineland. A strange war. But here came May. A baptism of fire. The two hostile armies stood face to face, ready to leap. Every day a great battle could begin. Every day we waited for the order to attack. We even wished for it. It was necessary to put an end to the tense situation one way or another. However, an outside observer would not have noticed any signs of this tension in our daily work. The service started with morning sports, then the usual morning roll call, followed by either individual training or field exercises, after lunch, cleaning of weapons, from time to time there were company or battalion exercises. I took over a platoon of the second company. During the day I was a platoon commander, at the end of the service I was a trainee for the officer rank. During the day I did my regular duty like any other field officer. In the evening I had to prepare for my future duties as an officer, and as I had originally intended, the study of tactics in battle was to be at the forefront of the situation. Not so. It seemed more important to our Austrian-born commander that we learn to behave like noble gentlemen. Not only now it seems ridiculous to me. Even then I did not take it all seriously and aroused the disapproval of the adjutant, a nobleman and landowner from Mecklenburg, who was supposed to instill in us the habits and manners of the higher circles. I was taught what a table set according to the rules of decorum should be, which glasses were for white wine and which for red. But a few kilometres to the west of us, French reconnaissance parties were fighting our outposts. I was taught how to bow and how to ask a lady to dance, when to call a lady highness and when to call her countess, when to call her madam, and when such an address was inappropriate, and a few kilometres to the west, French and German artillery were shelling villages on both sides of the border. I was taught that an officer, we must not forget it, has a high responsibility and must be aware of it under any circumstances. Of course, I was taught this in passing by the same adjutant, for after all, the strain could suddenly come to an end, then the real war would begin for us behind the western rampart. The adjutant spoke sparingly of Poland. Warfare occupied little space in his recollections. Above all, he was interested in agriculture and Polish estates. We were certainly not privy to what was going on in the Wehrmacht High Command during these weeks and months. I quite admit that some generals were disinclined to drag neutral Belgium and neutral Holland into the war. There were some generals who were fond of the prospect of a new armed clash with France and England, and especially of a new world war. However, the generals who now, in an effort to whitewash themselves, more or less strongly dissociate themselves from Hitler in their memoirs. At that time, all the plans of aggression were approved by all subordinates. The general staff was working out all the details of their implementation, and the Führer was waiting for Providence to give him a sign. But apparently, at that time, the Providence did not function too well. The attack was postponed several times. It is true that we did not know what was going on in the higher authorities, but we felt the consequences. If the Providence gave a sign and alert was declared, we prepared full dressing, as it is supposed for a campaign, moved to the border and rejoiced that at last the days of waiting were over. Providence gave us a new sign. We were stopped and we moved back to our garrison. In this way the pass was moved back and forth several times. On the night of the 10th of May we again packed everything as it was supposed to be for the march, but left many personal belongings in place and moved towards the frontier. This time we were not stopped. At five hours and thirty-five minutes divisions of Hitler's Wehrmacht invaded France, Belgium and Holland. The commander of the first company drove the motorcyclist back to our barracks to call the field kitchen, which he left in place, expecting from previous experience that Providence would be capricious. After all, a field kitchen does not belong to the category of personal belongings. Nevertheless, during the whole campaign in France the company hardly needed it. The Wehrmacht was supplied from local resources. From books about the First World War and from the stories of our fathers and teachers, we knew something about the French and the British. It was known that the Poilu and Tommies were hardy and brave soldiers. We knew also about the big battles, the war of machinery, the hurricane fire, the Kemin des Dames and Verdun. 
There were many officers among us who had fought in the First World War and who told a different story from that of Irish Maria Remark. Still, they felt no less feverish excitement before the battle than we young men. We could easily imagine the Maginot Line, a deeply echeloned system of long-term defensive fortifications which could serve as a barrier to any offensive of the German army. The entire divisions were stationed in these concreted fortifications, in underground casemates connected by communication lines and narrow-gauge railways. These dugouts were packed with machine guns and flamethrowers, grenade launchers and cannons, the gun emplacements. Well camouflaged from aerial observation, carried heavy artillery on the gun emplacements that sloped downwards. Behind this fortified rampart in these gun-shielded fortresses, the French army was waiting for our attack. At this rampart should be, according to the French general staff, bleed German armies. In the deep dark night we drove through the last sleeping German villages. The population, accustomed to such troop movements, paid no attention to us at all. We rolled further and further away. In the distance we could hear the thunder of cannonade, on the horizon we could see flashes of shell bursts. We rolled further and further, and with each new stage of the way the tension increased. We reached the border. The barrier was shattered into splinters. On the other side, a bombed-out customs office with empty window openings. It was the exciting moment we had dreamed of. It is a peculiar feeling to enter a foreign country. We spelt out the French signs on shops and restaurants. We wanted to see the French. But there were only empty and ruined houses, deserted streets, extinct villages. The entry into enemy country was not as heroic as we had imagined it to be. There was no firing. A tanked division rumbled before us, and we moved after it. We were disappointed. The next day we encamped in the forest. From far away came the rumble of artillery cannonade. Over our heads we could hear the rumble of passing German aeroplanes, which were heading west with a heavy load of bombs and returning back without bombs. We were in suspense, believing that positional warfare would now begin. Officers familiar with it from the First World War were suddenly talking about it, talking more and more about the casualties it was bringing with it. Now some of them perhaps remembered remark. Only my company commander, Major Peter of Schwerin, who was lying next to me in the grass, looking up at the sky, said to me, Minza, this is going to be a dirty business. Courage is a good thing, but caution is even better. Remember, too, that full cover is among the techniques we are trained in. As is customary, I reply. That's right, and hovered between courage and caution. In my heart of hearts, I was leaning towards boldness. This was probably due to the fact that I had not taken part in the First World War, and probably also because the artillery was still rumbling somewhere in the distance, and we were still only bothered by flies. But surely this was due primarily to the fact that I wanted to distinguish myself. For years I'd been a soldier, trained day by day only to be ready for the hour. I had been taught nothing else, but that courage was the highest virtue of a soldier. And now my own company commander is harping on caution, fever before battle. In the evening the order to march was finally received. Our division was pushed forward all the way to the fortification line. The infantry regiments encamped in front of the dugouts which they had failed to take at the first attack. It was now necessary, under cover of darkness, to bring up anti-tank guns and anti-aircraft artillery to suppress the French fire as soon as dawn broke. Our platoon commanders, forward. We on our motorbikes made our way along the columns to the company commander and received instructions. To reach my allotted section, I had to drive over a bridge over a small stream. It was under artillery fire. Already before me, the infantry had been forced to pass over this creek. The bombed vehicles and torn bridge railings testified to the accuracy of the French gun crew's hits. Before giving my platoon the order to move out, I first rode out myself to reconnoitre. I had not yet entered the bridge, but it was already thundering. I jumped off the motorbike as quickly as I had never managed before, at least faster than I had ever demanded of my recruits. Lightning flashed all around. The thunder of bursting shells was heard and there was a mad screech of flying shrapnel. I didn't feel that I'd shattered my knee. I didn't think about the possible shrapnel damage to my motorbike, carefully kept in perfect condition. Nor did I think about my driver. There was only one thing on my mind, so that's how it is. Then I smelled an unfamiliar odour, a peculiar mixture of diesel oil and petrol, blood and phosphorus earth and cinders, in short, the smell of war. Then came another volley and another, I pressed myself tightly to the ground. That was my baptism of fire, only after a few minutes. 
It seemed like an eternity to me, did I call out to the driver, who was happy to hear my voice, but I was also relieved when he answered. Then we sped onwards. Get away from that bridge, from that stench. Behind us we heard another burst. When we'd gone a few hundred metres, the infantryman shouted something to us. We slowed down, and some figure emerged from the gloom of the night to ask rhetorically if we were crazy because we were causing French guns to fire with our stupid motorbike. Motorbikelet, he said. I suddenly remembered that such a contemptuous name for a motorbike was forbidden in the army. We went on foot to the battalion command post. The commander endeavoured in the dark to explain to me where the dugout we were to capture in the morning was located. Apparently he was happy that he had gained a strong support in my person. He imagined that it would be enough for us to get as close to the cement blocks as possible, as we would fire on them and remove them under his very nose. Obviously, he attributed to our 37mm guns a tremendous striking power, but he could not explain how we would get our vehicles and guns up there. That was, after all, my business. But the task was difficult. It could be considered established, since the battalion commander and I.A., not without reason, talked lying down, the French all the terrain shot from their machine guns. Although it was hot enough in the front line, we still had an unpleasant feeling at the thought of having to go over the same accursed bridge again. However, there was no other way to get back to our platoon. We waited for another shell to burst, and then my driver rushed over the shaky logs, with the buggy hitting the helmet, or was it the head? Jumped up so sharply that I nearly flew out. I had certainly exaggerated the risk a little when I explained the situation and the task to my commanders in as much detail as possible. Probably I exaggerated under the impression of my happily passed baptism of fire, or with concern for my gun crews. Probably both. The platoon crossed the bridge without loss. We took cover behind a small ridge and prepared the guns for battle. The pulling up of the guns, the hum of the engines, and the orders of the gun commanders, sometimes too loud in a battle situation, all this noise attracted the attention of the French. The machine gun fire intensified. Flares dispersed the night gloom, illuminated the space in front of us, and scattered sparks in the darkness. Meter by meter the crews pulled, pushed, and pulled the guns forward. In order to bring in the shell boxes, the gun crew had to make their way several times under machine gun fire. Soon the whole platoon, drenched in sweat, took up a poorly defended position, and we had hardly had time to catch our breath for a few minutes. When it began to lighten behind us, the dawn was dawning. A new day had dawned. The day of our first battle, everything was different, not as we had anticipated. True, the French long-range artillery gave volley after volley. Mortars and guns from the inner dugouts of the Maginot Line were operating with the same intensity, but our calculations were driving shell after shell into the slots of the front dugouts with the speed they had been taught. From the positions behind, anti-aircraft guns and artillery were shelling the French fortifications. Very close machine guns of our infantry gradually moving forward, deafeningly quacked mortars. So it went on for three hours, a very long... Then they appeared with white flags and raised hands, white and black, in identical uniforms, Frenchmen and soldiers from colonial units, Europeans and Africans. They wanted to live. They did not want to be annihilated in the bunkers of the Maginot Line, in the inaccessibility of which they had recently believed. Officers Epaulettes Although the fighting in the following days was often very heavy, and with heavy casualties on both sides, we still expected that in general the French soldiers would put up a more vigorous resistance. We asked ourselves why it was sometimes possible to break French resistance so quickly, but our explanations did not go beyond our army outlook. Evidently the French general staff pinned all its hopes on the Maginot Line and disposed of its reserves accordingly. However, the most thorough, deeply echeloned, equipped with weapons, concreted defence structure loses its significance if it can be bypassed or parachuted across it. In addition, we had the impression that the French population was psychologically underprepared for war. The containment tactics used by the French government completely confused both the civilian population, a significant role, of course, played the breakthroughs of the French front, when penetrated deep into the rear of the German tank divisions, disrupted communication and supply of the French armies. Fighting on the front line of the French soldier found not only that his part bypassed, but also that he was deceived. The myth of the impregnability of the Maginot line was dispelled, and since the French soldier believed in it, along with the collapse of faith in the Maginot line, it was broken and his will to resist. 
The rest was done by Goebbels inspired targeted propaganda. Let me give you one example. Already a few months before our offensive German planes scattered over the French position's postcards, which depicted a French soldier in the guarding of the front line of dugouts around only exploding shells, and in French it is written, Hold the postcard against the light. Anyone who examined the postcard would find an image of a typical French bedroom. A charming French woman on the bed, a man next to her, and British military uniforms on the chair. Similar methods were used by propaganda during the First World War. Naturally, French soldiers were seized with indignation at the thought of being forced to be in the front lines while British soldiers were amusing themselves with French women in cosy bourgeois flats. There is no doubt that Goebbels used with diabolical skill the tools of psychological warfare. After breaking through the fortified defensive line, our division, like a powerful shock wave, made its way first to the west and then in a northerly direction. At the Aymar Basse Canal, we first met the British. They fought as hard and fiercely as we expected them to. Literally at the very last minute, they raised their hands and nonchalantly, with an arrogant and indifferent expression on their faces, surrendered. It was as if we did not exist for them. During interrogations, whether we dealt with soldiers or officers, it was possible at best to find out the most insignificant trifles. Apparently, the British were convinced even then that they would ultimately emerge victorious. The case was different with the French. They were often extremely agitated. The soldiers were directly pouring out the feelings of disappointment and indignation that had boiled up in their souls. As we passed columns of French prisoners, we heard more and more often the cry, La guerre est finie, la guerre est finie. Our division, suppressing here and there local resistance, was moving in marching order further and further towards La Mancha. Our anti-tank battalion, with very few exceptions, did not have to fight at all in the kind of combat for which it was intended. We supported the infantry with high explosive grenades, shelled and destroyed infantry positions in trenches and machine gun emplacements. We had some casualties, but no tanks were in our sight. The French army did not have independent tank units, but distributed to infantry divisions fighting vehicles, most of the obsolete type. If tanks were encountered in their original positions, they were either bombed by the German Luftwaffe or destroyed due to the overwhelming advantage of the German tank divisions. Many German soldiers who took part in the French campaign fought hard for days or even weeks. Others, for the entire time, did not make a single shot because their division marched in the second echelon and with the incredibly fast pace of events, it did not have to participate in the fighting. We moved forward, guided by the marvellous maps which were at our disposal in large numbers. They accurately orientated us with regard to all militarily significant objects, such as lines of communication, rivers, terrain, fortifications, garrisons, and even bridges only recently built. If, as a result of our rapid rush, we suddenly appeared in the position of French convoys, it was for the most part an indication of the fact that our rear services were not with us. At any rate, we seldom saw our field kitchens, and if they were there, there was not enough time to distribute food. Nevertheless, we had a pretty good life in France. None of us suffered from thirst, although May was unusually hot and June even more so. There was no shortage of drink, though even at normal temperatures it was consumed in large quantities. We invariably found occasions to have a feast, if only to celebrate the daily successes of our unit. But in addition, we listened to reports on events in the whole theatre of war on our radios, and not a day passed without the victorious fanfare of the Weermark bulletins. On 14 May, after a terrible bombardment of Rotterdam, Holland laid down its arms. On 28 May, Belgium capitulated. The British Expeditionary Army was in the area of Dunkirk, surrounded by army groups A and B. One can imagine that with such rapid advance, we were infinitely surprised when one day at dawn our advance stalled. A French select division had been assigned to cover the retreat of the British. The French artillery fired with remarkable accuracy. It was enough for any one of us to stick out his nose, or for a liaison to run across the street, or for a car to appear anywhere, and already with a thunderous blessing was sent. We occupied the outskirts of the village, and the shells hit the houses. It was morning, the sun was rising. It was midday, the sun was frying mercilessly. This day we suffered from thirst, because it was impossible to bring water even from the houses close to us. The hiking flasks were empty, we had French brandy, we had red wine and champagne, all heated up, and the champagne fountained out of the bottles. 
We tried to move back to make a detour round the French positions, but at the slightest movement a barrage of fire fell upon us. I was lying in a gully and would have given much for a glass of water. Suddenly I noticed that someone puffing and puffing had rushed into cover beside me. It was the battalion adjutant, Lieutenant Dieter Mali, tall and slender, just as young officers are portrayed in children's picture books. He was always cheerful, though he could be serious when necessary, correct and fair. It was on such occasions that the soldiers said, Nice chap, we were friends. He poked me in the side and exhaled. Best wishes, her Oberlatent. What the hell do you want here? Did something special happen? I assumed I would get a combat assignment from him from the commander or hear something else appropriate to the situation. Instead of answering, he only grinned and repeated. Best wishes, her Oberlatent. I just didn't understand him, didn't take his words seriously. Of course, I hoped for a promotion. All that was missing was a test in frontline conditions. I turned on my side and shouted back again. Stop this nonsense and tell me at last what's the matter. Here I quickly jabbed my nose into the ground. The French had spotted the lieutenant running in and had planted some more shells on our position. After we had been blessed, Lieutenant Maun congratulated me again, already in full uniform on my production. From an Oberfeld Fabel, I turned into a Herr Oberlutnant with officer's epaulets, gold star and silver cord. This was the day I had been waiting for since the beginning of my service. In anticipation of this day, I attended one course after another and crammed in my spare hours. I wanted to get out of the class of privates and became a non-commissioned officer. I wanted to get out of the class of non-commissioned officers, so I became an officer. In my imagination and dreams, however, the conferment of the rank of officer was to take place quite differently, in front of the lined-up company, with the presentation of a solemn letter of commendation, with a sword and everything else. Meanwhile I was lying in the mud and was already an oberlutnant, but still without officer's epaulets, without a silver cord and without a sabre. Nevertheless, in my eyes, this moment was the most significant in the whole course of life I had travelled but still not so significant that the adjutant had to rush through a zone of artillery fire in an endeavour to inform me of my new official position. Somehow or other, it was only towards evening that I managed to put on my officer's e -paulets. There was no time even for a little celebration. We regrouped, and that night we resumed the pursuit of the British. After the encirclement of the British corps at Dunkirk, we again changed direction and moved forced march to the Somme where the French entrenched, entrenched on the opposite bank. Aterized divisions, using all available vehicles and continuously shuttling back and forth, brought our exhausted infantry to the spot. After a thorough aerial reconnaissance, our offensive began. On the heights of the Somme were positioned selected units. The French Alpine riflemen and colonial troops, the last reserves of France. The attack across the Somme seemed to us a risky venture because we had to make our way to the coast on flat, well-viewed terrain, and we had to reckon with the possibility of heavy losses at the crossing and in the fighting for the first small strongholds. Therefore, probably, General Weygand hoped to hold the defensive line named after him. But here came the dive bombers, and they operated without interruption, squadron after squadron. Like birds of prey, they nonchalantly circled over the positions. The French anti-aircraft guns almost did not interfere with them, found targets, then with the ominous glissando of their sirens plummeted from the sky. At the very ground they threw out their bomb load, and with roaring engines went up again. And so relentlessly, machine after machine, link after link, squadron after squadron. One after another, the bombs struck and crushed the French trenches. Beams and trees together with clods of earth were carried away in gigantic fountains into space. Men and machine guns flew into the air. Heavy guns were blown to pieces. The air waved through vehicles off the roads. A terrifying hell, hours long blows of a giant hammer, exhausting the nervous system. Then our sappers and the first infantrymen in inflatable boats crossed the river, captured in several places pre bridge fortifications, and under their protection built the first pontoon bridges. The French, still alive in the trenches, were completely demoralized, still in various places, still flared up resistance but already finally collapsed illusions which were associated with the French line Weygand. German divisions inexorably. A continuous stream moved to the south and west of France, to the Atlantic coast, across the Seine, bypassing Paris and at Nantes, across the Loire towards Bordeaux. 
further and further south to where the peaks of the Paris mountains were visible on the horizon. On the 10th of June, we heard the news on the radio, which we received with mixed feelings. Italy had declared war on France. We had been disappointed when Italy had remained neutral during the Polish campaign, and after France and England declared war on us, had not actively come out on our side. Now that we were advancing unstoppably and France had been defeated, the entry of Italy into the war caused us no jubilation. We could not get rid of the impression that Mussolini was jealous of Hitler's success and glory and wanted to at least ensure for himself a share in the spoils of war, although he did not take part in the struggle. On 22 June 1940, France capitulated. True, a large part of the country was not yet occupied, but France no longer had such reserves at its disposal that could have a decisive influence on the outcome of the war. Initially, we could not understand why the army and civilian population of France offered relatively weak resistance. But when the military and political circles of the country so quickly expressed their readiness to enter into negotiations with Germany, the background of events became clearer to us. But still with our then political views, we could not fully realize the deep meaning of betrayal of the national interests of France by its dominant circles. So an armistice was concluded. With flaming cheeks, I read books about the war in my childhood and listened breathlessly to the stories of my teachers and later of my superiors. And now the hour had struck, the hour of revenge for 1918. My pride was boundless. The armistice negotiations had once taken place in a railway carriage in the forest of Compiègne. Since then, that geographical name and that wagon were known to the world. In the future, the wagon was in a French museum. Hitler had worked out his plan of revenge to the smallest detail. He ordered the immediate delivery of this wagon and the same forest, exactly to the same place where it had stood in 1918. Here, the French General Pétain signed the terms of the armistice. We were delighted and applauded as after a terrific performance with popular actors. To the French, it seemed that for them the war was over. Slowly releasing themselves from the paralysis caused by the rapid defeat, they went back to work and to their usual activities, as well as to the work which our so-called civil administration was now forcing upon them. In the evenings, however, they had political conversations in cafes over apparatives at small tables on the pavements. They berated the government, both the previous and the present one, which was now in Vichy. When I went to the barber's shop, and who among us officers would refuse such a luxury as a shave for a few p -fenics? There was an icy silence in the salon. All my attempts to utilize my school knowledge of French remained fruitless, but there wasn't a single Frenchman who wouldn't let me through out of the queue. No matter how many people were waiting for service, I was always the first in line. They treated me like a guest, albeit an uninvited one. Sometimes it seemed to me that maybe they were scourging themselves and fueling their resentment along the lines of. Let him go ahead now. The day will come when any French barber will refuse to wash the face of this Bosch. It didn't bother me. I would tip the barber. He would open the door before me with the polite phrase, You revoir, monsieur? But you could read on his face that he would probably most willingly give me a kick in the ass. I once witnessed an excited discussion. The main speaker was a small, stocky man who looked like a peasant in his woolen waterproof jacket. He shouted incessantly at the barber, who tried to calm him down. The owners don't like noisy arguments in their shops. They paid no attention to me. Try as I might, I still struggled to understand only part of what was being said. It was about the incident at Oran. I'd heard about it on the radio this morning. The British demanded from the Vichy government the surrender of the French fleet anchored near Oran, off the coast of Africa, and thus out of the hands of the occupiers. The Vichy government wished to retain this fleet under the terms of the armistice. But the French General de Gaulle was in London. He was there organizing resistance to Hitler. He did not care about the armistice, he did not sign it, and he demanded the extradition of the fleet. The Vichy government rejected the demand. The British Navy then sank the French ships at anchor. The people in the barbershop were outraged and scolded the British. They did not realize then that it was the right thing to do. The sacrifice was necessary so that Hitler could not lay his hand on this squadron. But for the time being, Goebbels used the incident for another trick. Huge posters and French newspapers controlled by the German propaganda ministry. Radio appeals and speeches by bribed collaborators were to make it clear to the population that the Germans were their true friends and that the British, on the contrary, were their historic enemies. New obligations were then imposed on the French. France was to supply, 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 and the French had to work, work, and work again, 
the German civil administration bought everything it could buy. Cargo routes and trains with holidaymakers headed for Germany. Soldiers sent home parcels, officers sent parcels, and generals sent whole freight wagons. All of this was paid for with paper money of the occupation, colourful bills of exchange with payment in the distant future, when the whole of Europe would be under German rule, an unheard of robbery. Then the trains rolled into Germany with French labourers in greater and greater numbers. Finally, British bombers appeared. They were thrown against us, but inevitably French factories, towns and villages were reduced to rubble. Churches, castles and museums were incinerated. Houses and farmyards were burnt down. Many innocent people died. Calamities fell upon a country which had once been for four long years the scene of warfare. The armistice, which the French welcomed partly with a sigh of relief, partly in despondency, was not the end at all. It was the beginning of a new period of terrible suffering, through which, however, had to be passed in order to free France from fascist occupation. See, Lyon, you will receive the first company immediately. The commander of our unit, Colonel Schwarzbeck, made something of a speech. He expressed wishes for success, talked about the tasks of the company commander, about my predecessor, about the future, and various other things. But I didn't take much of it in. I heard only one thing, company commander. A few days earlier, the Honourable Major Peter had pinned the Iron Cross to my uniform, probably for a reconnaissance operation, for attacking a line of dugouts, or for all of them together. Already this alone made me happy, I could now safely be in the neighbourhood of soldiers who had already received this order in the First World War. But now I became a company commander, and this was of much greater importance. As already mentioned, our regimental commander was an Austrian. He had little knowledge of our unit, the guns, the tanks and his tasks as a commander. He had been an artilleryman during W1 and was constantly trying to get us accustomed to indirect. He would prefer our 37 Gem anti-tank guns to fire from positions on the reverse slope, as he fired his mortars somewhere in the Carpathians or the Alps. All this met with no sympathy on our part. In other military matters he took little interest. At the table there was only talk of Viennese cuisini, Kaiser Schmarini and other flower dishes. If an officer of our unit had a birthday, he had the right to order the cook his favourite dish for everyone at the table. The commander hoped that this trick would be an occasion for a gourmet feast, but we shamelessly ordered only potatoes. Colonel Schwarzbeck didn't stay with us long. He was transferred back to Vienna to some motor park. The soldiers were hardly sorry to see him go. He had no better relations with them than a cotton plantation owner with his labourers. The colonel hardly knew his soldiers and was constantly confusing surnames. He was succeeded by a Prussian, surnamed von Bruckner. This soon memorised the surname of every soldier. Nevertheless, his relations with them were no better than those of his predecessor, but he ate potatoes willingly. So we were back in our own environment. Otherwise, Bruckner completely corresponded to my then idea of a real soldier. He was a strict commander. One day he took me aside. You've been promoted from private to officer? Yes, Lieutenant. When were you promoted? I gave a detailed report. He examined my mixed uniform. I was still in the uniform of an Oberfeld feeble with sewn-on officers' buttonholes and epaulettes, and wore a cap with a silver cord borrowed from a comrade. Hmm. Quickly change all this. Order the tailor to make you a uniform and then introduce yourself to me again? Yes, Herr Lieutenant Colonel. I was now an officer, but I was not to say anything other than I.E. A only with a slight bow and with my hand at my visor, as I had been trained to do. If the commander was in a favourable mood, he would take my hand away from my cap with a careless movement. He was in a favourable mood, and that's how he ended the conversation. I will keep you in mind. A few weeks later he sent me to the company commander's course at the tank school in Wonsdorf near Berlin. Here I was taught what I could not be taught by the adjutant I mentioned in the Rhineland. In Wonsdorf, much less importance was attached to the treatment of countesses and bowing. Here, one was trained for a very different dance of which we had no idea. When I returned from the course, it still seemed to me that Hitler and the general's staff, probably under the impression of the astonishingly rapid course of events in France, did not yet have a concept of further military action. In any case, the Wehrmacht had taken up positions at La Manche and on the Atlantic coast and was awaiting further orders. If the crossing to England was envisaged, as we expected, preparations should have begun by now. My company was stationed in barracks at Elie Rochesayon. 
nearly Sable Dordon, a favourite seaside resort of Parisians. The summers there are dry, the wide, undulating white sandy beach is replaced by a high rocky shore. When the sea receded at low tide, countless rocky islets rose above the water. Black smoothly polished, they dried up in a few minutes and heated in the hot sun. When the tide came in again, the islets became smaller and smaller and disappeared into the raging surf, a charming corner of the earth, made even more beautiful by the presence of charming Parisians. That was probably the case, but in 1940 they were absent. We were the ones who ran the resort. Along with formation training, we, of course, conducted field exercises. In order to combine the pleasant with the useful, I several times travelled with the company to conduct exercises on the seashore and in pauses allowed swimming. Each time the time allotted to the exercise was shortened and the bathing was prolonged. One day we wanted to practice pitching, tents and bivouac skills. We stayed the night on the shore, rising in the morning followed by bathing, then the usual combat training, bathing again, and finally at sunset cleaning of weapons. The soldiers were so diligent in their combat training that I thought that it would be possible to do without frequent trips back and forth and save petrol. So, at any rate, I justified to the commander my suggestion that the company should remain ashore for a longer period. He gave his consent. Soon bathing became our chief occupation. But as the commander had said to me, I will keep you in mind, I had to reckon with the possibility of his sudden appearance. Indeed, he came occasionally for exercises and always caught us doing business. Only once did we bear this pleased him very much, and he began to appear less frequently. It did not occur to him that his adjutant and my friend Dieter Malm sent me a radiogram every time the commander was going to visit us. That way I was never taken by surprise. And once we bathed so that there would be no suspicion that we had been warned. Thus in our studies the main place was occupied by water drills, and this had its reason. I myself swam well, with great passion. In the ricks we are every soldier had to know how to swim and dive to become, if possible, a swimmer who knew the rules of drowning rescue. However, among the recruits of the last conscription and in the reinforcements sent, the majority could not swim. And these were almost exclusively natives of Pomerania and Mecklenburg, which were constantly near the Baltic Sea and numerous lakes. They had all learnt to swim. I achieved this by a trick which I would never have remembered later had it not been for Hans Bever. This lanky, unusually calm Mecklenburger had been in the first company as my chauffeur in France, in Holland, and then in the Soviet Union. He knew no fear except for the safety of his car. I could rely on Hans Bever. He was always on the spot and always in a good mood, but he couldn't swim either. Until my transfer to the German Democratic Republic, I met him. He was working as a tractor driver in an agricultural production cooperative on the coast of the Baltic Sea. Naturally, sharing our memories, we started talking about our time on the Atlantic. Here is what he sang. Back then in France, of course, we all wanted to go on holiday. But you couldn't get a leave of absence without showing a certificate of passing a swimming test. That's why we all learnt to swim. That's how it really was. Anyone who could not pass a 15-minute swimming test in the presence of the platoon commander and could not produce a certificate in the form I had introduced had no reason to apply for leave. Such was my modest contribution to the preparation of Operation Sea Lion before it was even talked about. It is not for me to go into an assessment of the speculation as to where Operation Sea Lion would have led. And at that time, as a humble company commander, I had no basis for such speculation. We thought it was indisputable that we would cross the Channel, land on the shore, win and occupy England. They curse the Meuse across the Skelt and the Rhine we march. We march straight to France. Now it echoed from walls and houses. Because we're going, because we're going straight to England. Ah, ouch. Go, go, thought probably the Frenchman. I hope many of you will choke at the crossing. After all, La Manche is not the Mars or the Skelt and it is not possible to throw logs across such a water space. The preparations for Operation Sea Lion were simply pathetic. The intendants and special forces travelled the surrounding countryside and procured all the corks they could get their hands on. Somehow they were to be made into life jackets. Equally hemp and rope were obtained to make rope ladders and cables. All varieties of vessels, from herring boats to larger ones, were rented. These were used to train troops to shoot at targets on shore and to land on shore. In addition, as many rolls of wire mesh as possible were taken out, 
cut into strips five metres long and distributed to the vehicles. These carpets of unwound wire were to prevent the vehicles from getting stuck in the sand. Nevertheless, the vehicles moved very slowly because the five metre strips had to be thrown again each time. Preparations for Operation Sea Lion led to the fact that officers, up to platoon commanders, held continuous command and staff exercises. The higher headquarters held a series of meetings with officers of the Luftwaffe and the Navy, and everyone else refreshed their knowledge of English. Meanwhile, all this did not work out. We had at our disposal sufficient maps of the British coast and inland territory, excellent maps with all the details, excellent aerial surveys by which we could reproduce the relief and all the details of the terrain on a sandbox. However, while we were still travelling along the sandy shore of the Atlantic Ocean, and then were marched by night to Cherbourg to be a little closer to the British Isles, while we were still learning to sail and English, the Führer's thoughts were already occupied with Moscow. Being on the banks of the Channel, we could not have realised this. We regarded England as our only enemy anywhere in the world, and we had a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union. So, we were still waiting for good weather and orders. The weather was good, the sea was as smooth as a mirror, but the order never came. What next? Summer passed and nothing happened. Our division had reached the highest level of combat training. We could say of ourselves fit. We didn't say we were ready to perform, we said fit. This was the result of English classes and studying maps of the English coast. One day it seemed that we were getting into action, but it was again only a redeployment. We arrived from Cherbourg in Holland, near Eindhoven. Again the command and staff exercises began, for before us there was another stretch of coast. We had to land elsewhere. Again we rolled on our carpets of wire nets, this time on the Dutch shore and on Dutch sand. Again we practiced boat handling and firing. In the meantime September had come. Bathing was no longer a real pleasure. In any case it was no longer possible to bask in the sun. Then the command and staff games stopped and the wire nets began to rust. The fascist leadership had clearly abandoned the intention to organise a landing in Britain. Now it was necessary to achieve victory by bombing alone. The great battle for England began, followed by bomber raids on unprotected cities, which caused a retaliatory action of the British. Now the task was to destroy completely Coventry's England. The main target was London. Already by this alone we could guess that the sea lion was dead. When preparing a landing, bombarded the bases of the navy, harbours and coastal fortifications, but not located in the rear of the capital. Then it was officially announced that we do not have to capture the island, risking unnecessarily too much. Luftwaffe itself will be able to deal with England. The final blow will be dealt to the British by our submarines, which will soon be sinking ships of greater tonnage than England is able to launch additionally. We were quite pleased that unnecessary casualties were supposed to be avoided. We were, indeed, prepared to cross the channel and fight, but just before the finish, it seemed close again. No one wanted to take excessive risks. As it seemed to us at the time, the war was virtually over, and if the gentlemen from the Luftwaffe were able to see it through to the end themselves, that suited us just fine. There were already rumours about the disbandment of some divisions. Soldiers returning from leave talked to people who had indeed been dismissed from the army and had resumed work in their professions, mainly in the military industry. Of course, we were talking exclusively about divisions with high initial numbers, reserve military units. With regard to us, a cadre unit, there was no question of disbandment. In my company, as in others, had to go home about a third of the personnel. In return, we were replenished. They were young recruits who had been waiting in Kohlberg with feverish trepidation for their dispatch, fearing that they might not arrive too late. Gunned everything started again. Gun drills, platoon drills, company-wide drill. In addition, short-term leave was granted. Short-term, as it was explained to us, so that everyone could go home one more time. We didn't think much about such explanations. Whoever had a turn would go home loaded with cheese, butter, cocoa and the famous Dutch cigarettes. Meanwhile, the requirements in combat training had become more stringent. They were not imposed by our division commander, the famous General von Siedlitz Kurzbach. It was like that everywhere else. We learnt about it when we had to talk to officers from other divisions, but just like us, the prevailing opinion among them was that it was only about England and that the war had come to an end.
we were convinced that the war was already won. When the service permitted, we travelled around the country. Holland already had exemplary motorways. And, in addition, it was possible to travel quickly from one town to another in an electric train, past almost immense fields where flowers and vegetables were grown. The fields were sometimes interspersed with bright green meadows where sleek, well-fed cows grazed. When one speaks of Holland, one cannot help but imagine windmills and wooden clogs, funny white bonnets of women and light blue, as if joking headdresses of men. When I think of this country, I see many small, perfectly clean houses, colourful with bright windows and dazzling white curtains. Several of these cottages were requisitioned for the needs of the officers of our unit. The owners were either evicted or emigrated. Each company commander lived in a separate house with his valet. Junior officers lived in twos or threes. In the evenings, we visited each other. The summer was followed by a rainy autumn. Hurricane winds blew in from the North Sea, which swept over the Dutch plains with such force as if they wanted to carry away from the country everything that was not firmly fastened. The autumn was followed by an unpleasant winter, sometimes cold, sometimes penetratingly damp, so that people fled in their houses from the miserable weather. We celebrated Christmas almost as in peace, envying the holiday makers who spent those days with their families in Germany. Almost all officers remained in their units. Only the regimental commander, Lieutenant Colonel von Bruckner, went on New Year's leave after Christmas. He was replaced by the commander of the Third Company. We celebrated New Year's Eve at his place. Our table was furnished with almost all the viands and drinks that Holland, France, Denmark and Norway could supply with wine cellars and kitchens. We believed that the New Year would bring peace, and in anticipation of a happy ending, we reflected on the events of September to December 1940. It is true that we were only direct observers of what was happening, but what we knew strengthened our sense of confidence in the future. In September, the head of the Romanian state formalized Romania's accession to the Rome-Berlin axis. Training units of the German army and air force entered Romania. Thus, the Wehrmacht laid its hand on Romania as well. The Italians attacked British Somalia and crossed the Libyan-Egyptian border in the direction of the Suez Canal. At the end of October, Mussolini, having leapt across Albania, brought his troops into Greece in order to turn the Mediterranean Sea once more into a mare Romanum. The British then moved most of their air force to southern Greece and turned Crete into their air and naval base. Then followed some failures, not with us, but with the Italians. They suffered major defeats in Africa and had to give Cyrenaica to the British. They were also driven out of Greece again. We were partly annoyed by these events. But at the same time, we regarded them with gloating, for the Italian failures strengthened our pride in our victories. At the end of November, our enthusiasm was further increased when Romania, Hungary and Slovakia, one after another, announced that they had joined the Germany-Italy-Japan Triple Pact. So we thought that we had enough reasons to celebrate the New Year serenely, and enough reasons to toast the well-being of the fatherland, our comrades, the new and the health of the future, filling our glasses with the most expensive trophy champagne from the almost inexhaustible French cellars. We had enough occasions and champagne to lose our heads in our arrogance and forget that we had hoped to return home in 1941. We were not burdened by the consciousness of guilt and responsibility. We didn't have it then. Not yet then. In the room where we were feasting, there was a map of Europe hanging on the wall. On this map, the commander of the third company had shaded with a charcoal pencil all those countries in which we marked units were stationed. When the fun reached its highest point, someone came up with a wild idea. Each of us had to close our eyes and fire a single shot from a pistol into the geographical map. The hits would point to the targets in the direction of which we would march in 1941. We greeted with noisy jubilation the hits on those parts of the map on which England, Spain and Africa were marked. We cheered those who hit a target anywhere in the Balkans. We ridiculed whoever took too far to the left and hit the vast ocean, or took too far to the right and hit the Soviet Union. The wild shouts were replaced by a languid silence, when suddenly our host exclaimed in horror, Stop it! Stop it! There's my soldier lying on the bed behind the wall. With these words he rushed out of the room. We squeezed in after him and found the attendant unharmed. He was lying flat on the floor. Our firing all over Europe nearly cost the life of one soldier that New Year's Eve. The beginning of the New Year was not marked by a victorious drumbeat. On the other side, in England, bombs were rumbling. But the English did not stay in debt and in return bombed the Ruhr area, 
Sometimes some of the soldiers of the company went home to attend the funerals of their relatives. We remained in Holland. The exercises continued as usual. Gone was the arrogance that had gripped the pass on New Year's Eve. We were now back to our assumptions that no more major events were to be expected. Meanwhile, Bulgaria and Yugoslavia had also announced their accession to the Three Power Pact. This strengthened our conviction that Germany was actually determining the course of history in Europe. I was just busy with the platoon commanders drawing up the weekly training plan when the company field sergeant entered the room. Her, her Oberleutnant, a new message has just been received. May I read it? Of course, please. There's been a military putsch in Belgrade. The government has been ousted and the anti comintern pact has been cancelled. For days, there were anti-German demonstrations in Yugoslavia. Puzzled, we looked at each other and thought roughly the same thing. How could this country dare to break a treaty with Germany that it had just concluded? The German response did not have to wait long. German bomber squadrons rained down on Belgrade. German divisions entered Yugoslavia. Tanks rumbled across the country and advanced further into Greece. Now the Balkans were being cleansed as well. Only three weeks passed and Yugoslavia capitulated you on 17 April 1941. Five days later, Greece surrendered after British troops were evacuated by sea and thus taken out of the game. By 1 June the purge was complete. Not a single British soldier remained in the Balkans, and the last units of the Yugoslav and Greek armies laid down their arms. The Yugoslav state disappeared from the geographical map. By Hitler's will, it was no longer to exist. That was what the radio said. And that was what we said after it, repeating without a hitch all the cynical terminology, years of training, Goebbels' propaganda, which always had at the ready the proper arguments to justify any act of aggression, and not least the fervour of lightning victories. All this led to the fact that we were not at all embarrassed by the idea that right was on the side of the attacked peoples. What opinion the Yugoslavs themselves held, no one thought about, neither in the top leadership nor among us. We did not know that the masses of the people had withdrawn into the mountains and forests. We had not heard of Joseph Bros Tito. In addition, during those days we were interested in other matters. At the end of April we received an order to prepare our unit for relocation. We wondered where they would send us now. The Balkans were out of the question, that everything happened on schedule. It was unlikely that we were going to be transferred to Africa. We did not have the necessary equipment for that. In addition, it was unnecessary. General Rommel there has already defeated the British and within three weeks recaptured all of Cyrenaica. If things continue at the same pace, then his tanks will soon be at the Suez Canal and the British he chased away from there. In essence, we could only count on the fact that we were relocated to the homeland. We could not imagine the emergence of a new theatre of war anywhere. We thought that Europe was pacified.